High-speed trains between Hong Kong and the mainland resume operations after almost three years of service suspension. Customs officers seize half a million dollars worth of COVID antiviral drugs in anti-smuggling operations. And an airliner with 72 passengers on board crashes in Nepal. Hello and happy Sunday. Hong Kong's high-speed rail services to the mainland resume today. After almost three years of COVID-induced hiatus, the services got off to a smooth start on its first day of resumption. Ticket processing has become more digitized, although real person help is also available. Jackie Lin walks us through the procedure. The Hong Kong section of the high-speed rail link celebrates its relaunch with gifts given to the first batch of passengers. The first express rail link train to Shenzhen North departed West Kowloon Station at 7.03 a.m. To enter the restricted area, passengers need to take off their masks for facial recognition and scan their mainland travel permits. There's no need to present the physical tickets anymore, aligning with the practice on the mainland. Those who face difficulty here could choose to seek help from these counters. During security checks, railway staff would check your PCR test results. Alcohol rubs and spray are not allowed on board. Then you can leave Hong Kong via the e-channel. Cross this yellow line separating Hong Kong and the mainland port area. Scan the QR code of your health declaration record and you're good to go to board a train. Among the passengers on the first train, this man said he's very excited about the railway's relaunch, adding the high-speed rail shuttled passengers straight to Shenzhen's urban areas. Running at less than 200 kilometers per hour, Donggan Hao, the first express rolling train departing Hong Kong today, reached Shenzhen North Station on the dot. High-speed rail passengers only have to tap their home return permits to enter the mainland. Jacqueline, TVP News. Passengers using the high-speed rail to come to Hong Kong also arrived in the city this morning, with many of them returning to Guangzhou within the same day. The MTR said several passengers were declined entry as their PCR test results failed to meet requirements. Timothy Lee reports. At 7.42 a.m., the first batch of passengers arriving in Hong Kong from Shenzhen via the high-speed rail link were greeted by Secretary for Transport and Logistics Lam Sai Hung and Secretary for Culture, Sports and Tourism Kevin Yeung at West Kowloon Station. The two offered gifts to the passengers and expressed wishes for them to have an enjoyable time in the city. Meanwhile, travelers arriving from Guangzhou are mostly business people or Hong Kongers, with many of them returning to the mainland on the same day. Many arriving today noted the ease and efficiency of the newly reopened high-speed rail. It's fast and easy and smooth. Everything was very good. Traveling is way easier now when the borders are open. And at least for me, this option taking the high-speed train is very convenient. I got a very good customer service and got a train ticket, so I'm happy. However, the MTR said several passengers provided PCR test results that failed to meet entry requirements and were sent back to the mainland as a result. Today, inbound travelers from the mainland are presented with gift bags containing items from the MTR and the Hong Kong Tourism Board. They include masks as well as a $1,000 gift voucher that travelers can use in the station's connecting shopping mall after providing proof of being passengers of the high-speed rail. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Many passengers arrived at the West Kowloon station early this morning to board trains for the mainland heading to stations such as Shenzhen North and Guangzhou East. The, rains, the trains going to Guangzhou East have a new facility, a meal cabin. Mimo Sengai has more details. <laughs> This is the first express train going to Guangzhou East Station from Hong Kong today. The train passed through Shenzhen North, Dongguan and Dongguan South stations before heading for its final destination, Guangzhou East Station. 
The first train from Hong Kong to Guangzhou East left the West Kowloon Station at 8.01 a.m. Despite the early departure time on a Sunday morning, most passengers were delighted. Announcements were played on the train to remind passengers to maintain hygiene throughout the journey. For many passengers, boarding the train is a big step towards being closer to their homes and families. Ms Chen said she is looking forward to going home to spend the Lunar New Year with her family. The new route uses Hersia trains, also known as Harmony trains, which have milk cabins in the middle of the trains, allowing passengers to order food. On this first train, there were various Hong Kong appetizers and drinks to choose from, such as winter noodles, steamed prom, and milk tea. It was also festive on the train, with many fine churns on the windows. The train arrived at its destination five minutes ahead of schedule. Passengers were delighted, with some saying they were looking forward to meeting up with family members. Mimosa Nai, TVB News. Zheng Yan Xiong, the newly appointed director of Beijing's liaison office in Hong Kong, delivered his first Lunar New Year address. Through the, through the video, Zheng Yan Xiong said the liaison office will fully support the governance of the SAR and he hopes different sectors could make concerted efforts to bring prosperity to Hong Kong. Sheng added Hong Kong has weathered the brutal impact of the fifth wave of the pandemic with a staunch support of the mainland. He said the reopened border provides the new momentum for Hong Kong to proactively integrate into the development of the nation. And Hong Kong should grasp the opportunity offered by the mainland. 59-year-old Sheng Yan Xiong succeeded Luo Huning yesterday, who has helmed Beijing's liaison office since the, in the SAR since January 2020. Hong Kong today reported 6,261 new COVID infections, including 1,070 imported cases. 66 more patients succumbed to the virus. Meanwhile, Hong Kong Customs have seized 380 boxes of antiviral drugs worth about $500,000 and arrested two people. Customs officers seized 250 boxes of antiviral drugs at Hong Kong International Airport on Wednesday. In a follow-up raid on a flat in Tin Shui Wai on Saturday, officers found 130 more boxes of COVID-19 oral drugs. A 40-year-old man and 34-year-old woman were arrested. Authorities will not rule out more arrests as their investigation into the case continues. A 72-seat Nepali passenger aircraft has crashed into a gorge while landing at a newly opened airport in the central resort town of Pokhara. At least 40 people have been confirmed dead. The cause of the crash is not immediately clear. Daniel Rao tells us more. Nepal's Civil Aviation Authority released a statement saying the twin-engine ATR-72 aircraft operated by Nepal's Yeti Airlines was carrying 68 passengers, including 15 foreign nationals and four crew members. Among the foreign nationals were five Indians, four Russians, two South Koreans and one each from Ireland, Australia, Argentina and France. Nepalese Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal rushed to the airport after the crash. He said the plane was flying from the capital Kathmandu to Pakara. He urged security personnel and the general public to help with the rescue efforts. Images and videos shared on Twitter showed plumes of smoke billowing from the crash site as rescue workers, Nepali soldiers and crowds of people gathered around the wreckage of the aircraft. As rescuers continue to scour the crash site near the Seti River, more bodies are expected to be discovered. Pakara, located 200 kilometers west of Kathmandu, is the gateway to the Annapurna Circuit, a popular hiking trail in the Himalayas. Pakara International Airport began operations just two weeks ago. At least 309 people have died in plane or helicopter crashes in Nepal since 2000. This as the country's weather can change suddenly and make for hazardous conditions. The Pakara crash is Nepal's deadliest since March 2018 when a US Bangla Airlines flight from Dhaka crashed on landing in Kathmandu, killing 51 of the 71 people on board. Danarel, TVB News. Peter Pavel, a former NATO military committee chairman, has scored a narrow win over billionaire ex-premier Andrei Babis in the first round of the Czech presidential election. 
The race to replace the retiring Milos Zeman will now head to a second round runoff ballot. Pavel is strongly pro-Western and supports further military aid for Ukraine, as well as the adoption of the euro. Babis shares Zeman's warm relations with Hungary's Viktor Orban, who has been at odds with European Union partners over the rule of law. Pavel has been endorsed by the country's center-right cabinet, and pollsters predict he will now have the edge in the second round. Babis, whose ANO party is the biggest in parliament, has framed the vote as a show of dissatisfaction with the government's response to high inflation and energy prices. Still ahead, Russia launches new missile strikes against Ukraine, leaving at least 18 dead in the city of Dnipro. Britain will send 14 Challenger 2 main battle tanks and other heavy weaponry to Ukraine. And a drive-by shooting in London leaves six people injured. Welcome back. Russia has launched another major barrage across Ukraine, destroying a nine-story apartment building in the central east area and hitting energy infrastructure in a number of cities. Officials said at least 18 people have died in the residential building attack, with more than 70 injured and dozens in intensive care. Britain, meanwhile, said it would send 14 of its Challenger 2 main battle tanks and self-propelled artillery guns to Ukraine in the coming weeks. Nazvi Karim reports. Shock and devastation in Ukraine's central east city of Dnipro, where the war came home to residents of what used to be an apartment block. Rescuers toiled overnight searching for dozens who were missing after a Russian missile strike destroyed a section of the building where officials say 1,700 people were living. In the capital, Kyiv, residents took shelter in subway stations as air raid sirens wailed onto the streets above them. Another wave of Russian missiles hit critical infrastructure in Kyiv. As officials say, people faced a difficult time with blackouts, water cuts and disruptions to heating in the dead of winter. There were also reports of strikes in the northern city of Kharkiv. Ukraine's top military command said Russia launched three airstrikes with 57 missile strikes and 69 attacks from heavy weapon rocket systems. 26 rockets were shot down, it said. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky again appealed for more weapons, similar to what the Russians have, to defend their cities. He also said he spoke to British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who promised to send 14 Challenger 2 main battle tanks. British media said four tanks will be sent immediately, with more to follow. The UK will also send 30 self-propelled AS-90 guns, operated by five gunners, and will train Ukrainian forces on how to use its latest military hardware. Meanwhile, Ukraine said fighting still continues in Solidar in Donetsk after Moscow said Russian forces had captured the city in what would be a minor victory for the Kremlin. Russian oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin said his Wagner group of mercenaries played a key role in the operation, which has involved intensive fighting over the past weeks. With Moscow looking to make the most of its Solidar advance, Reports from Russia say President Vladimir Putin will approve a proposal to raise the age limit for citizens to be conscripted into the armed forces. The Russian Defense Ministry wants to increase the age range to 21 to 30, from 18 to 27. Last year, Russia conducted a widespread draft to boost its forces in Ukraine by 300,000 soldiers. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has sidestepped a call to disembowel himself by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. Instead, at a news conference in Washington, Kishida said May's group of seven summit in Hiroshima should serve to uphold international order and the rule of law. Medvedev had earlier accused Kishida of shameful subservience to the U.S. and suggested the Japanese leader perform the traditional ritual of disembowelment. Kishida visited Washington on the last leg of his week-long trip to G7 countries that also took him to Italy, France, Britain and Canada. Instead of responding to Medvedev directly, Kishida said the G7 summit 
hosted by Japan in May, will work to safeguard international order based on the rule of law, citing Russian aggression against the Ukraine as the greatest issue. He said the war was not only a European problem, but also a challenge to the very rules and principles of the international community. Just more than a week ago, Russia declared a unilateral ceasefire during Orthodox Christmas in its war with Ukraine, the first time Moscow called for a truce since the conflict broke out almost a year ago. How important is Orthodox Christianity to both countries, and why is Orthodox Christmas not celebrated on December 25th? To find out more on this, Timothy Lee spoke with the Archpriest of an Orthodox Church in Hong Kong. On January 5th, Russia declared a 36-hour Orthodox Christmas ceasefire in a bid to pause the intense fighting in Ukraine, which Kiev dismissed as a ploy. Although a full ceasefire did not materialize, Orthodox Christmas means a lot to both countries. This is because most Russians and Ukrainians, being Orthodox Christians, celebrate Christmas during the first week of the new year. According to a survey on religious identity conducted by the Pew Research Center, the populations of both Russia and Ukraine are made up of a solid Orthodox majority. Around 71 percent of Russians and 78 percent of Ukrainians are at least nominal members of the church. And why is Orthodox Christmas not on December 25th? Father Dionysi, who serves as the archpriest of an Orthodox church in Hong Kong, said the difference is mainly due to the church's continued use of a calendar dating back to the Russian Empire. It's a difference of calendar uh, itself. Uh, you, actually, I would say all Christians in the world, including Orthodox, celebrate Christmas on 25th of December. Uh, but our civil calendar is different from George calendar for two weeks. Calendar of Russian Empire in 1917 uh, was two weeks civil calendar, different from European. And George somehow keep this difference up to the now. Father Dionysi said opinions on the war are divided among believers. Russia also there is a big division uh, uh, among uh, believers uh, in the attitude to this war, actually in the whole society. And a big part of society does not support uh, uh, this war and uh, think that it's a big mistake and a big trouble for both countries, not only for Ukraine, which are destroying now, but also for Russia. Meanwhile, Professor James Morton from Chinese University's Department of History believes that the church could help to eventually bring the warring parties together. Professor Morton is an expert on the history of the Orthodox Church. Um, the historical trend, interestingly, uh, since 1991, since the breakup of the Soviet Union, is that both countries have become a lot more religious than they certainly used to be in the communist years. So in terms of reconciliation, um, I think the Orthodox Church certainly can play a role in reconciling the two sides, but only after the political differences have been resolved. Orthodox Christians believe that lighting a candle inside a church symbolizes prayer and also an offering to the church. With war raging on in Ukraine, many of the faithful in the two countries continue to seek spiritual peace in the shelter of the Orthodox Church. Timothy Lee, TVB News. In London, a seven-year-old girl was seriously injured after she and five others were hurt in a drive-by shooting on Saturday afternoon. Police said the girl remains in a life-threatening condition in hospital after the shooting not far from Euston train station. A 12-year-old girl was also among the others injured. She was taken to hospital with a minor leg injury but later discharged. Police said four women were also taken to hospital with one said to have suffered potentially life-changing injuries. The Daily Mail newspaper reported that the victims had been among those attending a funeral for a mother and daughter who had died within a short time of each other in November. That is the news. Thanks for watching. Pearl Magazine is up shortly. Bye for now.